Good evening, and welcome to our Christmas Eve worship service. We're so glad that you're able to be with us uh, this evening. Whatever time you're able to watch us, this works out in your schedule. We're so glad that you're taking time to be a part of our uh, service. We're going to be talking about the gifts of God and how they have come from different people throughout the Christmas story. And so we look forward to sharing that with you this, today and this evening. Um, also, just a couple of things. You may have had a chance to swing by church at one of the pickup stations uh, that were there to get communion elements like the prepackaged wafers and communion cups and tea lights and you know Christmas Eve bulletins and all that kind of good stuff. If you didn't, whatever elements you can have, whatever you have at home, to also join in communion, you are more than welcome to. So uh, please don't worry about that. And also just a friendly reminder as well that tomorrow on Christmas Day at 9.30, we are going to be having our children share the Christmas story from the congregation virtually. And so it's going to be premiering 9.30 on Christmas Day. So please feel free to grab a cup of coffee or hot cider and join us for that as well. And on behalf of the whole staff, please know that you are loved. We miss you, and we we wish we're together in person, but um, we have to do it this way for now. And just want you all to know that throughout the service, it's a little bit different format than usual. So we're not going to really have prayers with petitions. We'll have an opening prayer, but please know that the staff and I are praying for you folks, and we'll continue to pray for all of you and your needs, and just know that... Um, Again, we love all of you very much and wish you and your family a blessed and Merry Christmas. I hope you enjoy the service. Both the tune and original Latin lyrics of O Come All Ye Faithful were probably written by John Francis Wade around the year 1740. Wade was a refugee from religious persecution in England who taught Latin and church music at the English College in Douai in northern France. Frederick Oakley's English translation was made in 1841, but has been altered by many hands over the years to produce the hymn that we sing today.
We continue with our call to worship. Silent night, holy night. Behold the wonder, born in light. Born a child, yet a king. A promise fulfilled, the angels sing. Sing of love, sing of life. The Prince of Peace shall end all strife. Let us pray. Loving God of all people, we thank you for the gift of people who help to tell, share, and celebrate the good news of God that first Christmas. We thank you for the gift of their witness about this amazing child who is Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us and for us. We also feel the hope and the joy of this overwhelming sense that we are loved by the, this holy, humble, simple birth of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. On this Christmas Eve, this one that is probably like none other in our lifetime, we gather to worship the newborn king. Tonight we want to share with you all the people who were gifts of God, doing God's handiwork that first Christmas, and how they help to share a message that changed the world and our lives forever. We'll now continue with our service. The first lesson comes from the ninth chapter of Isaiah. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests on his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This ends the first lesson. So our brothers and sisters in faith of ancient days, definitely a gift from God for us today. Uh, and let's try to draw a parallel between the ancient days and today. Um, it wasn't long ago, it was in fact about a year ago, that we were saying to each other, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. <laughs> well, 2020, Happy New Year, right? Uh, tough, tough year for us. And if we look at the people of ancient days, it was a tough time for them too. They were under oppression from years and years of wars and, and governing bodies that, uh, that were um, lording over them. And they were the people walking in darkness that we just heard about in the scripture. Um, similar to our day today where we feel like we're kind of walking in a little bit of darkness here. Um, and the text or the, 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 that was just read for us, we hear that the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And there was a sense of hope that came with that. Um, this light, a child, which would be born, and that that child would be, become the person in charge, and that he would become wonderful and mighty and everlasting, and his reign would be full of peace. Peace. The hope for peace during dark times. The hope for peace now in this child who will become the master. And interestingly enough, at the very end of this passage, we hear that it's the zeal of the Lord Almighty that will accomplish this. 
Zeal is a great word because it's not some warm and fuzzy kind of love for us that God does this. It's zeal. It's intent. It's powerful. It's very focused. It's very passionate. God loves us so much that he's going to put his full focus into providing the hope and the salvation for us during dark times. Thank God for the gift of the ancient people to show us that there is hope. Merry Christmas. The words of joy to the world are a paraphrase of the second part of Psalm 98, made by Isaac Watts, one of the leading hymn writers of the 18th century, first published in the Psalms of David in 1719. Watts reworked the text of the psalm to give it a more New Testament emphasis. The music of the hymn was adapted from several phrases in Handel's Messiah by Lowell Mason, one of America's leading music educators of the 1800s. The second lesson comes from the first chapter of the Gospel of Matthew and from the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke. We read Matthew 1 verses 17 and 18. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations, and from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with the child from the Holy Spirit. And from Luke chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. This ends the second lesson. This next section focuses on Matthew and Luke's Gospels. And Matthew's Gospel starts with the genealogy of Jesus. And we see three different groupings of 14 generations from Abraham to Jesus. And in all of these generations, there are only four women that are indicated before we hear of Mary. Mary, who was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. You see, in Luke's Gospel, shortly before what we read today, the angel Gabriel came and told Mary that the Lord has found favor with her, that she has been chosen to give birth to the Holy Son of God, to the Messiah. You know, I wonder how she felt, not just in that moment, hearing those words from the angel, but I wonder how she felt as the Christ child grew inside of her. How she felt as she was ready to give birth to the Messiah. You see, Mary is a true model of what it looks like to be a servant of God. Humble, 
surrendering herself and trusting God completely. She emptied herself to allow for the incarnation of God. And as we read here in this section, Mary treasured the words of the shepherds, the same words that echoed what Gabriel had told her. Mary, ordinary, humble, releasing her fears in complete trust of God's word. Mary is a gift of God. The German carol, Lo, How a Rose, may date from as early as the 15th century and is based on a prophecy from Isaiah 11. There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of its roots. Published versions of the melody are found as early as 1599 and the version familiar today was created by Michael Pretorius in 1609. The name Pretorius is simply a Latin translation of one of three common German surnames, Schultz, Schulteis, or Richter. The third lesson comes from the first chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, verses 19 through 24. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife. This ends the third lesson. In our reading from the first chapter of Matthew today, we find ourselves observing 
as Joseph is preparing to quietly leave his wife over her pregnancy. For a woman to become pregnant by another man was a killable offense. Joseph's decision was an unusual choice. But what really stands out for me is the fact that after waking from his vision in which he converses with an angel, he chooses to remain with Mary and adopt her child. For so many people today who have been hurt by the rejection of their biological families for so many different reasons, it's often the families we choose rather than the families we are born into that become our rock. Joseph chose to pass on his family name and his lineage to Jesus. He accepts him as his own. What a great example for us. This year, as we have had plenty of time to examine our own families and friends through the lens of this pandemic, who is the family that you have chosen? Who has chosen you? God is the ultimate example, bringing each of us into the spiritual family. With open arms, God calls us into relationship. As we continue to ponder family, both biological and those chosen, remember Joseph's example and cherish the people you love. Amen. Joseph Liebherr, Joseph Mein, is not only one of the most popular Christmas carols in Germany, it is also one of the oldest, dating back to the 14th century. The carol is associated with the medieval custom of rocking a cradle during Christmas services. The English translation of this text is by Percy Dearmore, though it has been adopted and shortened. The original had eight verses.
Jesus Christ, who came to earth to save us. The fourth lesson comes from the second chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came from Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means the least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people of Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent to them Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there, ahead of them, went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. This ends the fourth lesson. The passage that we've just heard from Matthew's Gospel should really be called the After Christmas Story. First we have the 12 days of Christmas, and then on January 6th, the Feast of the Epiphany, when we remember the visit of the wise men to the infant Jesus. At FULC, we telescope Epiphany into Christmas, and we don't even have a service for Epiphany unless January 6th happens to fall on either a Thursday or a Sunday. But in Europe, Epiphany is a really big deal, especially in southern Germany, where it's called Drei Königstag, or Three Kings Day. In a clear parallel with Passover, people use chalk to mark the doors of their houses with the year, a star, and the letters CMB. Those letters stand for Kaspar, Melchior, and Balthazar, according to legend, the names of the three kings. In the Bible, the only king with a name in this story is Herod. In fact, it never says that the wise men were kings. It doesn't even say there were three. No, I'm not trying to ruin your Christmas. But truth be told, some of our images of Christmas Eve are based as much on Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer as they are on Matthew, Luke, and John. Kings and camels make beautiful Christmas cards, but if you carefully read this story in Matthew, it's clear the wise men don't show up five minutes after the shepherds on Christmas Eve. In fact, their appearance might have been almost two years later. Skip the movie. Read the book. Epiphany is a story about a spiritual quest. To understand the goal of that quest, we have to look inside the treasure chest at the gifts. Gold is a gift that you render onto Caesar because, like Caesar, Jesus is a king, the king of the Jews, tracing his ancestry back through three times 14 generations. But if you've read their stories, you'll know that Jesus and Caesar have nothing in common, because Jesus came to be a king like no other. And Jesus is also God, and so he is given sweet-smelling incense, the kind still burned as an offering during religious services today. But Jesus is also God like no other, Emmanuel, God with us. Huh. And then there's myrrh. We meet myrrh a second time in the Gospel. When Jesus' body is removed from the cross, Nicodemus brings a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about a hundred pounds and wraps the body in linen cloth along with the spices. 
Matthew wants us to remember that Jesus is a Savior like no other, or to turn it around, that we have no other Savior but Jesus. This COVID Christmas, we are all in the part of our quest where we meet challenges and adversity. In this daunting hour, follow the example of the wise men and follow the star. Don't look up. That's the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn. Look here and here. Learn from the wise men to follow the spirit of generosity, the attitude of abundance, and the outlook of wonder. And these will lead your heart through every struggle to its resting place. Merry Christmas. While the words of the first Noel were first published in Davies Gilbert's 1823 collection, Some Ancient Christmas Carols, the hymn is thought to date back to at least the 17th century. Gilbert reports that in the west of England, people gathered on Christmas Eve to sing carols while enjoying cakes, cider, and beer. On Christmas Day, the same carols took the place of psalms in the church services. lesson comes from the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke, verses 8 through 14. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, 
who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace among those whom he favors. This ends the fifth lesson. Can you imagine that? You're hanging out on the hillside, getting the sheep ready for bed, you're getting ready for bed, and wham, bright light, and an angel, an angel shows up to let you know that Jesus, Emmanuel, God is with us, is born. <laughs> Unreal. Hard to imagine, isn't it? And the interesting thing is it doesn't stop there. Luke 2, verses 13 and 14 say, And then suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. A multitude, a large gathering. I mean, if we thought that first try was loud, I could only imagine how bright it was, how loud it was, the excitement in the air. Jesus, Emmanuel, God is with us, is born. Those angels, <laughs> they are a gift, are they not? They were there when he was born. The angels came back to tend to him when he was being tempted. And an angel was the one who let our ladies know that he was risen from the dead. So clearly, angels are a gift to the story of Jesus, but they're also a gift to us. In Psalm 34, verse seven, it says, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Angels are known for singing and praising, for protecting the people and for providing comfort. And I find comfort in knowing that one day, when I'm at the throne, getting to see all the people who've gone before me, we're gonna be part of the noise. We're gonna be part of the fun. We're gonna be part of the shouting and the singing and the praising that the angels will be holding all around that throne. What an exciting time that will be. So in this present moment right now, there's no doubt, the angel let us know, Jesus, Emmanuel, God is with us. So let's sing about that gift, shall we? Let's sing a little Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Hark the Herald Angels Sing was written by Charles Wesley, an Anglican minister and one of the founders of Methodism. It was published in slightly different form in Hymns and Sacred Songs of 1739. The tune has been adapted from a chorus for men's voices by Felix Mendelssohn written to celebrate the 400th anniversary of the invention of the printing press.
The sixth lesson comes from the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke, verses 15 through 20. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. This ends the sixth lesson. The shepherds are one of my favorite parts of the Christmas story. Why? Because here, God is giving hope to the lowest group in the social order of the day. They are the ones doing the job that no one wanted to do, taking care of sheep. The shepherds are considered the outcasts and marginalized of the Christmas story. They're the ones no one cared about. And if there's hope for these guys, then there's hope for all of us. But those shepherds also were the ones that the angels came to. The angels did not go to the wealthy, the most intelligent, or even the religious leaders of the time. Those angels went to the shepherds, the ordinary, common, humbled group of working people taking care of the sheep. The shepherds listened to the song of the angels, and they responded. They went to see this child, Jesus. They went to tell, to witness, and to proclaim the Messiah's birth, glorifying and praising God, for all that they saw and all that they heard. The shepherds are a gift of God. Both the lyrics and the tune of Angels We Have Heard on High originated in France in the 18th century. The anonymous English translation was first published in the collection Crown of Jesus Music in London in 1862. The editor of that book, Henry Frederick Hemi, is also the author of the well-known hymn, Faith of Our Fathers. The seventh lesson comes from the second chapter of the Gospel of Luke, verses 2 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and family of David. 
He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. This ends the seventh lesson. Wow, we have had a lot of people uh, that we've been reminded of who have uh, been a part of the Christmas story and are gifts of God, right? Uh, the ancient people of the Old Testament who were saying, one day, someday, there's going to be a baby in a story. To Mary, giving birth to the Christ child. And in, the, and in it biblically, uh, when there's a birthing in the Bible, it's accredited to God's power and that God's in play. And what a moment that is and what a gift Mary was to the Christmas story and throughout all of our faith. And then there's Joseph, who trusted and believed in a dream. And he hung on to Mary and didn't give up on her. A part of the Christmas story and a great gift. Then the wise men come bearing gifts, recognizing and acknowledging who this Jesus, this little baby that's in a feeding trough and rags wrapped in rags, what he's going to mean to the world. And then the angels, right? The awe of the angels and their beautiful voices singing and proclaiming this Christ child. And then the shepherds, ritually unclean, socially despised. And God saying to them, God is saying to them, I need you. You're a gift in the story. Oh, what I want to do is just take a few moments to talk to you about God's ultimate gift. And we know where this is heading, right? This is heading to the baby Jesus. God sent Jesus, God's ultimate gift, to us. Not only to be a part of the Christmas story, but bigger than that, to help fulfill promises in the prophecies of all times that one day, someday, we believe that God was going to give us the hope and God has given us this hope through this Christ child, this baby, Emmanuel, wonderful counselor, Prince of Peace. Yes. It's interesting. I think about us in this moment. This is a really different Christmas, I'm sure, for all of us. And I got thinking about, well, what, you know, the sassy side of me is like, well, what's the upside to what we're going through? Well, I guess we don't have to get together a certain family for those family dynamics, right? And I couldn't help but think of the Nationals Lampoon's uh, Christmas vacation when Cousin Eddie shows up at Clark Griswold's house. You know, it's like that family dynamic that you really don't know what to do with. And I wonder for Mary and Joseph what their family dynamics were like. Because Joseph is taking Mary, who's ready to give birth and credit God's power, all the way to Bethlehem. Joseph's ancestry home. Joseph had to have extended family there. What was the function or dysfunction of that extended family? What, a great aunt or a, or an uncle or a grandmother couldn't say, hey, come stay with us. We got to help take care of Mary. What was going on? And yet all those people are in play in this Christmas story. I want to show you something. I want you to come with me because I just want to show you something and take you someplace. Because I got something else that I want to tell you, but I think it'd probably make better sense if, uh, if we were to leave right now. So anyways, why don't you come with me? Uh, we made it. This is where I wanted to come to finish up our Christmas message tonight. You know, someplace that we're very familiar with. 
But you know what, even though we can't be here tonight, we are very familiar with the Christmas story, right? And we know what the Christmas story is all about. Uh, we know that Jesus is God's ultimate gift given to us. And we know it's a beautiful gift. We know that God throughout God's history has used people to be a part of God's history and to be gifts to other people and to the world. And God's gifts, God's greatest gifts, come wrapped in people. People like you. People like me. <laughs> and I know some of us might be some pretty interesting wrapping paper. But the gifts of God come wrapped in people. And we gather here this night virtually because I want to show you a couple things. You may remember that you had gotten this magnet a couple weeks ago from your church family. And of course, you can use this magnet on your refrigerator to hold notes. And this is that frame that you got. Gifts from God come wrapped in people. It's so important for us to have you put your picture of you and your family inside this frame to remind yourselves and your family that you are a part of God's story of birth and new life. You are a part of Jesus' unfolding God's love to the entire world. Not only back then, 2,000 years ago, but this night. This night together. And throughout Jesus' whole life, he was constantly trying to wrap other people in God's love of who he was because the gift of the gifts of God come wrapped in people and the God, and God's greatest gift Jesus came wrapped in a person who wrapped others in love who wrapped others in mercy who wrapped others in forgiveness who wrapped others in Recognizing their presence when others wouldn't. The gifts of God come wrapped in people, and we have a chance to share with the ancient people of the Old Testament, to Mary and to Joseph and the wise men and the shepherds and the angels. We can share this story of God's ultimate greatest gift. This ultimate greatest gift, even before he took his last breath on that Friday, as he was gathered with his disciples that Thursday night, even then he was wrapping them in God's love. And remember the words that Jesus spoke? On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And again, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave for all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Please join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Now is our time to experience God's ultimate gift, to experience God's forgiveness, God's mercy, God's grace, and to experience the Christ child wrapping 
God's love around each and every one of us. This night, we will break bread and sip from the cup and say, the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. And church family, you too are a gift from God. Let's take a few moments and have an interlude and pause as we share communion on this holy night.
May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen us and keep us in his grace from this time forth forevermore. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, gracious God, that you have once again fed us with the food beyond compare, the body and blood of Christ. Lead us from this place, nourish and forgiven, into your beloved vineyard to wipe away the tears of all who hunger and thirst, guided by the example of the same Jesus Christ and led by the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Our benediction. Enable us, O Lord, to go forth into the world joyful and unashamed of the gospel, which nurtures all who receive it and offers eternal hope to all the servants of Christ. You have blessed us as we have worshiped. Support us now as we go forth to labor wherever your spirit directs. May your love and mercy and peace be ours forevermore. Amen. Before we get ready to sing uh, Silent Night, just want you all to know that I'm the only one here at church right now. There's nobody else in the building. As soon as I get ready to leave the sanctuary, this is going back on just in case there are, if there is anybody else in the building. Um, but please know that we are going to take everything we can to be safe this holiday season and this Christmas season. Go in peace, serve the Lord. The words of the world's best loved carol were written by Father Joseph Moore on Christmas Eve, 1818. The organ of St. Nicholas Church in Obendorf in the Australian Alps had broken down. The parish organist, Franz Gruber, rapidly set Moore's new text to music. Moore and Gruber, backed by the parish choir, sang the hymn for the Christmas Eve service, accompanied by Gruber on guitar. Though not published for another 20 years, the song quickly became known all over Europe and eventually the world. So